All right, everyone, we are back. I have Michael Waddell, the founder of MetaZoo. We just got done with this talk um, where Dennis was talking about how to channel that passion that we have as retailers into uh, marketing to our community, into communicating with our community and using that passion as a jumping off point. What I love about having Michael here is now we have someone who took that passion in a different direction, took that passion for gaming for Pokemon and then later Magic into game design, launched a Kickstarter in March for MetaZoo to huge acclaim. As Dennis said, MetaZoo, it's not a game you haven't heard of. It's a game you may not have heard of yet if you haven't because it is going on. It's out there like wildfire. The comparisons are like Pokemon and Flesh and Blood, which, I mean, those are some of the best comparisons you're, you're ever going to get in, in our industry. And I'm overjoyed, you know, obviously here at Channel Fireball, we're working with Michael, uh, and I'm overjoyed to have Michael here at LGSC2. So please join me in welcoming the founder of MetaZoo, Michael Waddell. Thank you so much, Mashi. Uh, hey, everyone. Um, is it okay if I go ahead and um, share my screen? Yeah, go for it. Awesome. So I'll do that. And then one second. I'll push from start. Uh, so, hey, everyone. My name is Michael Waddell. I'm the creator of MetaZoo. Um, we're, we're a relatively new uh, trading card game, but um, we've actually been around for almost a year now. Um, and, you know, the kind of the theme that I want to um, communicate to y'all right right now and through this next presentation and then obviously through the, the Q and a is that I really think of MetaZoo as a community driven TCG and, and I view the local game store as a, a major uh, partner in that effort. Um, so really briefly, who am I? I'm Michael Waddell. I, um, I grew up in Brazil, even though I'm American, I came to the U S and studied physics and math and, and really loved kind of, the idea of, of taking a problem and, and breaking it down and, and doing um, like maybe even solving unsolved problems. Um, and that passion actually, I think coincided really well with um, playing Pokemon, playing Magic the Gathering, collecting and, and kind of seeing how I could deconstruct things and then reconstruct them. Um, and so I've always been a huge fan um, of TCGs ever since I was seven years old. Um, I never really played competitively, but I was always there with my friends um, after school or, you know, at the local game store, um, which was a bit different in Brazil, but still very fun. Um, then COVID happened and I had an opportunity to take something that I've been working on for the past five years, um, and actually do something with it. You know, I'm sure everyone here has kind of a work of passion. If it's opening up the local game store or, you know, writing a comic book series, whatever it may be, um, you, you know, you have your day job or you have school and then you kind of have those late nights when you're uh, really making an effort to, to get something else that's off the ground. And with COVID, that opportunity was, you know, finally presented itself. So I believe it was in March, right after we got the stay at home orders that I was like, all right, I'm going to do MetaZoo finally. Right. <laughs> um, and so what is MetaZoo? Um, MetaZoo is very simply um, a vintage style of, of, of approaching a TCG that focuses on cryptids. And what are cryptids? Cryptids are uh, creatures or yokai or um, you know, mythological or folklore-based folklore uh, creatures that um, are supposed to exist in the real world, right? So you have your Bigfoots, you have your Chupacabras, you have uh, Mothman, and then you have literally thousands of others, right? And that's kind of the fascinating thing about MetaZoo and kind of the cryptid world is that there isn't really an end to what new uh, and creative creatures or stories or uh, folklores can kind of emerge because they're constantly emerging. I mean, we have uh, cryptids in our game that have emerged as early at, or as recently ago as uh, 2014, right? So like the Fresno Nightcrawlers. Um, and so these things are constantly evolving and, and they exist in the real world, which is, which is pretty fascinating, right? Um, and they exist in the real world in a way that MetaZoo from its start almost has a baked in audience of tens of millions of people, right? And these are fans of Bigfoot, fans of Mothman that have, um, kind of grown independently of each other uh, over the course of you know 200 years or so, 
Um, and we're treating MetaZoom as, almost as like a lightning rod for those, those stories. Um, and of course, we're, we're taking a story for MetaZoo and, and using it as a way of kind of adding cohesion and kind of a central focus for all these seemingly um, separate stories, right? And that's what the MetaZoo illustrated novel is going to be doing. I'll, I'll touch on that a little bit later. Um, but the, the, the coolest aspect of, of these cryptids is because um, they have developed independently, they've developed independently in their own communities, right? And so when I say that MetaZoo is, is community driven, um, that's because it has to be. That's because the, the origin of the, the creative nature of MetaZoo uh, is based in, in community uh, from, you know, from the very beginning. But uh, we, we took that, so I took that concept and obviously um, applied it to how I structured the company and how I started it, right? So um, yeah, what does community driven mean? Well, it means that from the very beginning, from the, the, the sourcing of the MetaZoo artists from Instagram, where I literally went through different artists and saw who kind of captured that old Pokemon, Ken Sugimori, uh, vintage style of art, um, reached out to them, you know, some of them are students, some of them are, you know, freelancers, some of them are biochemists, uh, <laughs> and said, hey, do you want to work on a cool project with me? And then, you know, coming up with enough art and enough uh, gameplay to then go to Kickstarter, where, you know, th the community aspect of, of fundraising uh, really paid off as well. We were able to successfully Kickstart. And then, in the, of course, in the intervening months between the Kickstarter being successful and uh, release in March, uh, we've had thousands of people join our Discord and really kind of contribute to the community in that way. Um, and, you know, the, the response from the community has been like tremendous, right? Enough that there were enough people who were making fan art and fan music and, um, you know, fan fiction in some cases that like we were able to do a, an art contest back in, in March and I've, we got hundreds of submissions. Um, and I'm still, going, I'm still going through them, but you know, we're going to take all those art, um, all that art that's created by those fans. We're, we're putting it into a, a, a mini set of 20 cards, and we're releasing it as, as a blister pack, right? And it's it's a pretty magical thing. Um, and so, with that community-driven aspect, it's been kind of a, a, a an interesting ride, right? Because we started out really small, and with the community's help and effort, we were able to um, make a lot of progress and just like nine to 10 months, right? So we had the Kickstarter, which was successful. And when I say successful, I mean like we wanted a $10,000 goal and we got like 18.5K, right? So really small change when it comes to actually uh, fundraising for a, a, a TCG that's meant to be this big brand, right? But, you know, um, in the intervening months, like I mentioned, we had to come up with kind of an idea of, of um, how we would kind of soak those fires and build the brand, um, in a way that, you know, not only drew more people, but obviously um, built like the community even more, right? Which is which is something that, you know, we ordered sample cards in September and we handed out those out for free. It was like 10,000 of them. Now they're the most um, sought after product, I believe, even more so than the Kickstarter product. We released um, several um, hundred uh, Halloween packs, just kind of focusing on fun Halloween themes and, and, you know, um, and then of course we had Christmas and we had new years. Um, and recently, um, beyond kind of that community growth, that community growth led to, um, the community reaching out and saying to PSA, to Beckett, to TCG player, for instance, like, Hey, are you guys holding MetaZoo? Are you guys working with MetaZoo? And, and enough that kind of that zeitgeist that, it snowballed in such a way that eventually PSA reached out, eventually Beckett reached out, eventually Channel Fireball reached out. And that allowed us to kind of start developing kind of what I call the benchmarks of pedigree um, that any TCG or any game really needs um, in order to kind of be taken seriously, right? And so this pathway, and now, you know, there, there are some things that I can't really go into, but, um, you know, we're on our way to kind of hitting those pedigree points um, very much so, and the, and then some, right? Um, so you know, I would say that getting in with the big distributors, for instance, is a big uh, you know benchmark for pedigree, and, and that's going to happen. Um, from a branding merchandising perspective, there are certain partnerships that 
are considered industry standard and those are in development as well. Um, and again, all this wouldn't have been possible uh, without the community kind of vouching for MetaZoo and, and really leading that effort. So it's, and, and by the way, the biggest part of that, of course, is reaching out to local game zone, local game store owners like you guys, and really making an effort to to ask, hey, are you holding MetaZoo? Uh, are you guys going to be playing MetaZoo with the Kickstarter uh, first edition? And then, of course, that works its way up, right? So that's really the 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 origin of impact is is this really this community based focus on on getting MetaZoo out into the world and getting it out into the world that is sustainable in, in as many ways as possible, right? So kind of where are we now from a product perspective? Um, and then, you know, where are we going, right? So obviously we released the Kickstarter in, on March 1st. And as I'm sure many of you know, it, it took off kind of immediately. Um, it sold out almost instantly. And now if you look at secondary market prices, it's very um, obvious that there's demand for this, right? And you might say like, hey, there's only really demand for it from, a, from an investing standpoint. But um, if you look at the underlying community, there's just so much passion from these thousands. Um, and I'm guessing tens of thousands of people now that I don't believe that to be true, right? Because um, you still have people who are buying these boxes and then opening them up for their collection, right? And that's all over YouTube. It's, it's, it's really fantastic. Um, but, you know, I view MetaZoo as more than just a, a trading card game, especially since it it resonates so much with the real world that I want it to branch out into as many kind of product verticals as possible. Um, that gives people who don't, for instance, have the money to buy the Kickstarter stuff an opportunity to, to participate in the brand in, in a different way, right? So I'm in the process of writing, um, you know, the illustrated story, and it's going to be coming out in chapters. And, you know, each print runs a few thousand. They sell out basically instantly. Um, but, you know, we, we released shoes yesterday, um, a thousand units that sold uh, in a day. You know, we're looking into NFTs. We're looking into plushies. Um, the idea is that MetaZoo has this pent up demand um, that doesn't seem to be uh, decreasing. It seems to be increasing and that's accelerating. Right. Um, and, you know, it's, it's very interesting from a, from a branding perspective, like where do you draw the line? Are you just a TCG or are you something that's bigger than that? And the fans seem to be wanting something that's bigger than that, um, which is great, you know, and, and I'm happy to accommodate, but that requires partnerships like with channel fireball where, you know, they can help with something like organized play. Um, and then of course, you know, help us get into these local game stores to sell, not just the TCG, but um, these other products as well. Um, so where are we going with all this, right? Um, it's the plan has always been to release numerous sets over the course of uh, 20 years. I have a 20 year plan, <laughs> um, but um, with kind of, the way that things have been going that's accelerated and it's changed in certain ways, right? Originally we, we, we wanted to release uh, our next set wilderness uh, in July, but when that was planned, um, that was very much something that was the product of assuming that the smaller Kickstarter print run would be, um, you know, popular and fun, but nowhere near where it is right now. Right. So we've, we've moved that to 2022. We're releasing the first edition um, in July. So that'll be without the Kickstarter symbol. Um, and then if we're going to have a, a nightfall um, set this October, that's going to be Halloween themed. Um, and then wilderness, like I mentioned, March of next year, and then UFO, which focus on, focuses on alien cryptids uh, summer 2022. And then we're going to have, you know, seance uh, for the kind of the Halloween fall theme of 2022. And then uh, we're going to have, you know, other ones as well, which I don't really want to spoil. But, you know, focusing more short term this summer, uh, you know, the first edition print run is already printed. Um, if you look bottom left, you'll see kind of the, the promos that are going to be part of the release decks, um, which aren't available to the you know public via direct consumer. Um, they're only going to be available through you guys, the local game stores. Um, think of them as kind of like uh, pre-release decks, right? Um, and with that, and with Channel Fireball's help, and hopefully the help of you all, uh, we're going to have organized play as well. And that's going to be something that we've already started on Discord, um, similar to what Digimon's doing with their webcam-based tournaments. Um, and we already have a system that's set up. We already have people who are accumulating competitive points. Um, and we're really going to 
uh, buckle down on that and, and, and enforce that and kind of help that grow um, this summer, right? Um, especially as the world is opening up, it's a fantastic opportunity to get more foot traffic into the LGSs. And, and I think it's just a, a really fantastic um, summer ahead of us. Um, and you guys, like I mentioned, are a major part of that, right? My ideology is very simple. Um, you can't go direct to consumer in a sustainable way um, if you're a new IP, right? And I believe, truly believe that local game stores are the heart of any new TCG, especially one that's focused on, on community growth, right? Um, getting as much product out to you all as possible, to as many local game stores as possible, to as many countries as possible is my priority. Um, especially since you guys are going to be on the front line uh, for getting this product in the hands of people who want it and, and actually play it, right? Like event, events that are focused around MetaZoo are going to be uh, a lot of fun. And I think that with your help, we can organize that in a way that's going to be, it's going to be a blast for everyone. And, and hopefully you guys can, can make some good business as well. Um, and so, you know, when, I, when Channel Fireball, when John reached out to me about, you know, talking here, um, to you all directly, I thought that was a really fantastic opportunity because um, I view you guys as partners and um, I think we're going to do a lot of good work together. So that's, that's basically it. I really wanted to, to leave a lot of um, time open for Q and A um, so we can kind of jump right into that if that's okay. Uh, sure. Uh, Michael, let me, if, if you don't mind, there, there's, there's some really uh, interesting ones in here. I have to admit that I, I myself am incredibly uh, curious about um, the, the, the first one that, that kind of tickles, tickles me is what was the first cryptid you wanted to make into a card? Like, was there, was there one that was kind of an inspiration? And you're like, this is the route we're going. This is what I want to do. This is the game I want to make. So what was that? Was, was there like an initial cryptid that really sparked all that? Yeah, actually. So um, I grew up, my, my first interaction with a cryptid that wasn't like Bigfoot was when I was, I think like 13, I watched the Mothman prophecies. Um, and it was kind of a spin on the Mothman tale with injured cold. And it was probably the, it, and still remains one of the most terrifying movies that I've ever seen. So like for me, when I think cryptid, I think Mothman, right? Um, and so Mothman, I actually have here, I'm, I, I, I don't have them right here, unfortunately. But I actually created, uh, dating back to 2017, uh, cards at home with various Mothman art that I did myself, um, you know, trying to see if I could use at home printers to actually print like Mothman cards. Um, so the card design itself and the ability that he has in the space set um, actually hasn't changed for the past three years. I mean, it's been fine tuned a little bit, but the whole skill of or the move called Mothman Prophecy is where you guess a card in someone's hand. And if you're successful, then, you know, something happens is, is something that I uh, was, it, it's really the first, you know, MetaZoo card in that sense, which is a lot of fun. Awesome. Uh, just to quickly for everyone, Michael, could you end your screen share? Cause then it'll just, it'll pop you and oh. I in there and we can just yeah, have a conversation. Of course. Thank you though, from Michael and MetaZoo, <laughs> the final message there. Uh, what um, you did this Kickstarter. It was very, very successful. You see this product, you know, selling so, so well. And it actually changed that you, you had this great, well laid out plan. And of course you had to change plans because of how popular the Kickstarter was. Going back there, um, are there any things you wanted you, you would avoid when making a Kickstarter? If you had to do it again, is there anything you do differently? And if so, what, what would that be? So I think communicating. So before Flesh and Blood and before MetaZoo, and, and you know, I'm cautious about kind of coupling those two things together because I think Flesh and Blood, um, even though it's it's only a year older than MetaZoo, it has, you know, it has much more, many more laurels and and um, you know, success is behind it. Um, but really before flesh and blood and MetaZoo, people were upset at the idea of, uh, a new TCG coming about. And if you said that, you know, God forbid you said that, um, you know, people would actually lash out at you. And if you go on the Kickstarter comments, you can see people who say, you know, the TCG format is dead. Like, why aren't you focusing on like a, um, you know, a board game, for instance, that captures the same stuff. So the, impact that that had on my planning was I didn't believe that um, there would be as widespread support for this as there was. 
Um, and so when planning, I was very conservative in both the print runs that I was, I was seeking um, and kind of the overall branding um, in terms of how many like product verticals that I was anticipating, right? So now if you look at, um, you know, if, if I were to redo it again, I would be much more uh, public about like, hey, we may be planning for 2.5K booster boxes, but that's just because of demand. Um, if more demand presents itself, we'll obviously do more um, because the, the impact of that was um, we just didn't, we, we weren't ambitious enough, right? right. And, and that's, that's echoed in terms of, you know, now the secondary prices for the Kickstarter boxes are crazy. And people are like, is this artificial scarcity? And it's like, no, we just didn't plan this. <laughs> um, so I, I would have been a bit more ambitious with the Kickstarter, I think. And I wouldn't have listened to the naysayers. I would have um, believed in the underlying product because I know and knew back then that it was a really strong one. I love it. Don't listen to naysayers and believe in the heart of the cards. That's, that's the message yeah. I'm taking now, away from there. I I will say the na- a lot of the naysayers, you know, you have to separate them, right? A lot of the naysayers were naysayers, sure, but they actually had fantastic feedback, right? And and it was constructive and, and um, you can usually, you know, it's gut instinct, but you can separate kind of the, the feedback that you know is, is meant to just be damaging and then the feedback that is actually meant to help you out. Um, and so, you know, I always welcome that criticism as long as it's meant to kind of help the game get along and, and grow. God, that is so important, isn't it? Because like every piece of feedback, whether even even the toxic haters, every piece of feedback normally tells you something. You just got you really got to know how to separate the wheat from the chaff. That is at every level of business, whether you're a Kickstarter or, you know, your channel fireball. And I imagine, you know, much, much bigger. That is such an important thing. Right. Because because I especially in this industry, everybody's got opinions about everything and they are <laughs> not shy about sharing them. So you got, but, but there's, there's always, there's always, even if it's just an atom, there's a particle of, of validity of these things. Oh, for um, sure. Yeah. Uh, Alexander Grandin asks, where is MetaZoo available for Canadian retail stores? Is there any Canadian market for MetaZoo? So um, that is a great question. I will say without um, hopefully um, getting in trouble because of pending contracts that the, Canadian local game stores um, that have a distributor um, will be able to, at some point in the near future, buy MetaZoo from those distributors. And that <laughs> that's the, the I think, the legally correct way of putting that. Um, I wouldn't yeah. worry about it. There you go. Yeah, we don't, we don't want to press you because these things can be delicate. But the, the answer is, it sounds like is coming soon. So Coming soon, um, yeah. Don't, don't they, worry they, about it. Right, right. It, it's, it's on its way. Uh, thank you, Alexander. Um, what is what, what has been the most exciting and most challenging part of bringing this new game to the market? I think choosing the right partners. Um, so obviously the hardest hurdle for any new game is, is reaching that critical um, level of hype. But then once you, and, and that's intangible, right? Like you can't plan for that and you can't really force it, right? But once it happens, all of a sudden it's kind of like being at a buffet and you have all these people who are reaching out to you and you have to get comfortable with telling people who might be like industry giants, um, like, no, thank you. Um, like, you know, this person is a better fit or this person um, didn't tell me to F off earlier on when we were nobody. Um, and, you know, we're going to go with them, even though they're the smaller option. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and so the hardest part for me is, is very much kind of like, now that we are the bell at the ball, so to speak, not taking personally the um, lack of response from some of the industry giants um, and, and then recognizing that it was just business, right? Um, and then, of course, balancing that with, with um, having to tell some of the earlier supporters who might not be able to scale with us that you know, they can't continue on with us in, that, in this journey, right? Because they just can't support us in, in the same way. Um, which is really, it, it's a hard thing to, to balance. And I'm certainly going to make mistakes and, and you all will be there to, to see that. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, that, that's kind of the, the hard thing right now is, is balancing kind of the love that I'm getting um, and, and having to make some hard decisions about who we go with. That's, and that's always, that, that's tricky, both uh, in success and with speed bumps. You know, you, those decisions come up on both sides of that. 
Absolutely. And I think success actually is way more challenging because, you know, speed bumps, you kind of see, you get to see, you get to see a little bit more truism from those around you, but success, everybody, everybody wants to jump aboard. Exactly. Um, <laughs> when we talk about uh, kind of the design of Meta, MetaZoo, if I can, if I can switch gears there for a second, sure. what are some of your favorite non-card games and were any of them inspirations for MetaZoo? Yes. So I'm a huge fan of um, kind of the Zelda world. And, and having, oh. um, you know, it, like it's, it's not, I think it actually, it lends itself to, so Nintendo in general for me is, is kind of a, a playground when it comes to creativity because it, it not only has all the good branding aspects to it, but the world building that's involved is, is fascinating. Right. So like Wind Waker got me through most of COVID and um, <laughs> like, it's, it's just, it's, it's one of those things that there's no, I love the idea of these open worlds and I love the idea of, of um, being able to actively participate in them, right? Um, and so when I'm when I'm writing the MetaZoo story, for instance, I I don't just take from you know the story Pokemon or or you know Magic the Gathering. I you know I'm a huge Dragonlance reader. I I read fantasy all throughout you know my childhood. Um, but I will say, from like a pure gaming perspective. I was the younger brother who got to watch my older brother play on N64 and PlayStation. Oh. And so <laughs> I, w- I wasn't always, and, and that kind of echoes into my life right now where I don't run out to get like a new game, for instance, because um, I'd much rather watch someone play it on Twitch. That's, mm-hmm. I know that's not a very fun answer, but I think most younger brothers can appreciate it. Can I tell you, this is a funny story because, uh, you know, Channel Fireball president and CEO, John Sasso, he's got two boys. And it's funny because uh, he 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 got he got them like a, a a Nintendo, an old school Nintendo emulator. And it was like his older one, JoJo, he could kind of play an interactive game, but the younger one, Jamie, he he's not able to. So they did <laughs> we, we would do the classic like hand him the controller that's not plugged in. Yeah. And, you know, and let him play along. And, and he thinks he's doing all this stuff and nothing's happening. So I, I think that's the classic like younger brother, baby brother situation where he's got the controller that's not plugged in. Um, that, or in my case, it was the, it was like the strategy manual. My brother would be like, flip to, you know, page 80. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah look at this. Like I'm on it, big brother. You know, um, I love team it, effort. Honestly. Yeah. There you go. That's awesome. Um, so Steve asks, we often get community members designing TCG and board games in store. What would you say to shop owners who get a chance to give a little guy a few feet of shelf space? It's interesting. Um, I would if you are actually serious about making a TCG or a board game or something like that, the idea is at least initially like uh, out the door to market, make the game cheap and accessible, um, make it easy to understand. Um, like MetaZoo takes a lot of elements from Pokemon, Yu-Gi-Oh, Magic from a gameplay perspective. And we're not shy about that. Um, you know, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. We just have to maybe reimagine it in an interesting way. Um, and, and that way the learning curve isn't very steep and people can feel comfortable and then they can appreciate the new aspects that you introduce to gameplay um, because they're not worried about actually just being able to play the game. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I would, I would like, it's kind of trite, but give away a lot of product for free too. Um, Cause people, if people aren't associating um, a financial decision to a product, then it's a lot easier for them to love it. Um, at least initially, right? So, yep. you know, the, the sample cards that I handed out for free, thousands of them, um, you know, it cost me thousands of dollars to send those out. But what ended up resulting was um, a a community of people who love the cards just for the cards themselves, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and that's that that's pretty fascinating. And, and it's not something that I expected or even planned. I just wanted to get people to have as many of the cards as possible, and and. But I would definitely, sorry, that's, yeah, uh, delivery. Uh, but, you know, that's definitely something that um, I would say you have to do. Um, spread the game as far as possible. And, and I think that that's kind of a proof is in the pudding, right? If you have a good game and you have confidence in your game, you want to get people playing it because then it's going to sell itself. Then it's going to be like, hey, Michael, check out this new game I got. Why don't you come over? Let's play it. It's a great game. Uh, and that financial burden of needing to pay for it you just remove that obstacle you got a great game you get them hooked and there you go and i i love that that you know you know um, loss leaders and even you know breaking even even losing money just to get that hook set i think is super important for gaming because 
the whole reason you've built this game, the whole reason you've made this game is because you believe it is a good, fun game. And getting it under people's hands is the best way to sell it. And I, I, I completely agree with that. Um, we have another question here. Um, with more and more card games releasing, there's a battle for shelf space. So in order to make a good decision about MetaZoo, what is the target audience? That's a good question. Um, so we have some more adult themes, I think, in the, uh, the art, for instance. And, and that's just because, you know, and that's that betrays um, or maybe that it, it, it contrasts, I think, the vintage Ken Sugimori approach to the art, which is definitely more childish and definitely softer. Right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but we're really focusing on people who uh, are, you know, 20 to 35. Um, but we have people who, as young as, you know, 13 that are playing. Um, the target audience are for people who um, played these games back in the late 1990s, early 2000s, who might have kids now and really want to share that experience with these kids. Um, mm -hmm. But I also, I'm, I'm, I'm constantly surprised by who tells me they play the game. And my, my previous job was actually, I was a, an equity analyst um, at Goldman Sachs, right? Oh, and wow. The, the number one thing that we saw, and this is what we were hired to do, was trying to dictate a target audience um, for your product generally fails. Um, what you should do is you should take a product and you know be true to the product, be true to your vision, um, put out put it out into the market, see what works and what doesn't, who picks it up, and you know pivot where necessary. And, and so in, in my case, it's, it's kind of like I envisioned a lot of people like me playing the game, but we have people who are in their 60s playing it. We have people who are below the age of 10 playing it. Um, and so taking in this data. Um, is a is an ongoing process, and, and I'm still learning, and, and I'm excited to see how the community develops. Um, and so the target audience really is right now just whoever loves MetaZoo, and that seems to be a growing uh, demographic. <laughs> yeah, you got to fresh the market. You 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 know, Ty, Ty, I think Tyson said it. Everyone's got a plan to get punched in the face. So you have this plan. You know what you you know what your uh, your audience you, your targeting is. But, you know, you want to take everyone, right? You, you put it out there and all of a sudden you thought it was this and it's all the way over here. And you're like, well, hey, that, that works for me too. So you get, you're figuring it out as you hit the road and as you develop and evolve the game, that's something we're always figuring out. Something we've learned at Channel Fireball too with where our audience is and what, what that can be such a moving target. And hopefully it's a moving but growing target, right? That's, that's what we there always want to see. Absolutely. Um, back, kind of back to the origins of MetaZoo here. What made you go with this art style for the game? I... A lot of these answers are just like uh, me kind of um, geeking out over <laughs> what I love, right? I mean, I love vintage Pokemon. I love vintage Nintendo. Um, it's simple colors. It's iconic posing of, of, the, of the characters and the composition of the art. But you can, at a glance, look at what the art is and understand it. Mm -hmm. and, and that's just something, like, I understand that the art, you know, in Magic and Pokemon and in the modern age is, is beautiful, right? It's fantastic. But I don't, um, it doesn't strike me as intuitively beautiful in the same way that vintage cards do. Um, and, you know, that's a preference that I have. And, and it's probably incredibly biased based on what I grew up um, understanding these cards to be, right? Those were my initial impressions. Um, but it, it seems to be resonating with a lot of people. And, and I think from an artistic perspective, uh, keeping things simple, keeping things iconic, um, especially since they allow fans to to remake them and they're like almost immediately, right? Um, right. I think it's beautiful, right? Like I think that someone can take one sh one glance at our one of our cryptids that our artists have you know reimagined in the MetaZoo way, and then uh, create their own splash art of it is it, it, it's almost like getting a song stuck in your head. Like it, it, if it's the right tune, it's usually really simple. And um, visually, I think that these cards accomplish that. I love that. We, you know, we were just, we had Dennis, uh, who's our director of marketing at the CFB group on presenting before you. And one of the things we kind of finished with is the importance of authenticity. And, and where we do that is we, you know, we find that passion and you have this passion for, you know, OG Pokemon and Nintendo, and you, you shouldn't dampen that. You shouldn't apologize for it. You need to maximize on it. And that's exactly what you've done. And that just comes through because 
that's the best marketing, you know, in this world that we're at in, in, in this Gen Z world with social media everywhere, authenticity is, is the most important thing. Cause, cause being fake and plastic, you, you sniff it out. So that, that's a great, great way um, to, to really have that impact for the crowd, for the audience, whatever audience you end up with. The other question about kind of MetaZoo design is how did you come up with this notion of breaking the fourth wall, right? MetaZoo, that's one of the, one of the very, very novel things about MetaZoo. It really breaks the fourth wall in terms of, you know, is it raining outside? How many lights are there? You know, all that kind of stuff. Like, where did that come from? So um, I was driving down to Orlando um, last March, right? From New York City, where I live, um, to visit family, right? Right as, right as things were getting crazy, right? Um, and if you've ever made that drive, it's it's absolutely crazy. Um, yeah, in terms of weather sometimes. But we were also passing these like cities and towns where these cryptids were were named after uh, because that's where they were seen, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, that mixing of weather with obviously kind of seeing these signs and, and stopping at a few of the museums along the way, um, you know, it got me having a discussion with my girlfriend basically saying like, you know, these cryptids are out in the real world. Um, the cards are a reflection of that. Um, it really makes sense for the real world to, to have a reflection in the game itself as well, where, you know, if you are playing a, a cryptid that's seen mostly when it's raining outside or if it's foggy outside or if it's in a hot area, like, of course, it should get like a, a boost or it should have in some way an impact on the gameplay itself. And so it's a really easy, like, it's a really simple concept, but there's so much you can do with it. But what was important to me was it, it was very authentic to the underlying backstory of the cryptids, right? These are things that are out in the real world. Um, and if they are meant to be in the real world, then the real world has to have an impact on them. Yeah. I, I love the idea that, you know, if I'm playing MetaZoo and there's a, a cryptid for my local cryptid, I'm just going to get bonuses playing with the, basically the local monster, right? Because the weather or, or whatever the environment is that, that has, drawn you know that cryptid to that area that's going to power the card so it's you, you kind of get like a, a home team favorite <laughs> so yeah. i mean sorry excuse me yeah absolutely and that's so cool but like that's just one format right we have um this other type of card called terra where you know if you want to run a frost deck in you know the middle of arizona and it's summer outside and you're boiling eggs on your the roof of your car for instance <laughs> um or frying eggs on the roof of your car uh you can use terra um, in order to like trigger certain f- fourth wall effects, right? So that's from a playability standpoint, using Terra to kind of circumvent those fourth wall rules. Um, it makes it way more accessible as a game. Um, and if you want to have fun, you can still have fun and, and actually make impose the fourth wall rules too. So, so with this incorporation of the fourth wall uh, and cryptids kind of being out in the real world, is there, you know, and, and we saw a bit of, of the roadmap, is there ever a time when you see like MetaZoo incorporating things like, um, you know, creepy pasta or SCP or any of those things that are kind of very, very firmly in the fiction only content of ur- the urban legend mythos. So the, so for SCP, it's, it's, it's tricky, right? People, that's probably one of the most common questions that I get because it's such a, uh, a rich lore, right? And, and they actually have, um, from licensing perspective, they're like open, right? However, what they aren't open to is like, you can't use their, their license to make profit, right? So if we ever were to work with SCP, oh. it would be something where we'd actually have to collaborate with the, the owners of that license, so on and so forth. That being said, I mean, a lot of the SCP stuff, a lot of the creepypasta stuff, it actually bridges into the real world. Because if you look at something like Slenderman, the whole idea, the whole mythos is that he is in our world specifically because people... Um, have brought him into existence by telling his story, right? And there's so much like that. I mean, the the Cthulhu mythos has things like that. Um, that being said, that stuff is, if we were to do that, it would be kind of like a mini set, I think. There's so much potential with real life cryptids, like yokai, like they're a different name, but yokai are essentially mm-hmm. cryptids plus time, right? Sure. Uh, and so like we're right now we're in the Cryptid Nation block then the plan is to go to Yokai Island, which will be much more focused on kind of the Yokai. Um, and then, you know, I envision sets where we go to Brazil and Brazil has a, a really rich uh, mythos and, 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 and folklore that, I mean, so I guess my point is, is there's no shortage of material. 
and dipping into fiction, I think should only be done in kind of an unset type of way. Um, but we'll see. We'll see. I, I, I love that. Yeah, it's true that we don't need to change source material because we haven't come anywhere near exhausting it yet. Yeah. Exactly. Um, so you, this is the second time you, you, you mentioned Brazil, you mentioned uh, growing up in Brazil. And when you said that, I said Pokemon and other TCGs were a bit different. Did you use any of those different styles of play as inspiration for MetaZoo? Um, yes, in the sense that, <clears throat> and that's actually, that kind of reveals something where because we didn't have like local tournaments that we would go to as kids, uh, we oftentimes made up our own rules. <laughs> and I don't think that's <laughs> uncommon in the TCG world. So like we would come up with very elaborate rules um, that would kind of fit the limitations of the cards that we had. Um, sometimes the cards were in languages that we didn't speak. So we had to kind of make things up. And, and so that was actually kind of my first experience with the creation process where my friends and I very naturally, just so that we could, functionally play some of these games uh, would come up with rules. Um, and there wasn't kind of the support from the community at large where we could go to a local game store really and like work our way up the, the, the tournament brackets, right? Like the closest thing that we really had were like, I mean, we're, we're, and we're talking like 1998 to 2003 when I was really in the, the heat of this, right? Mm -hmm. Um were like internet cafes where you know people were playing CS:GO and and like in in their off time when they had to give up the computer to the next person you know they would be playing um you know magic or pokemon or you know Yu-Gi-Oh and and you know so it, it was it was a different world right um i do wonder how things would have been different if i were growing up in the US at the time but um i certainly had a lot of fun you know i i even even today, if you go into a commander game, there's house rules. You know, yeah. I, I feel like every kitchen table, whether it's Pokemon or Magic or Yu-Gi-Oh, has house rules. And I, I still remember them when I was learning Magic in the in the you know mid '90s. Like certain things just didn't you know didn't work certain ways. Like I remember the big one for me and my friend group was Wrath of God, which very specifically says you know, bury or cannot be regenerated. We're like, no, nah, yep. it's too powerful. You can regenerate yeah. through Wrath of God. That's, that's too good. You know, like yeah. we just literally looked at the card and said, nope, we're not going to do that. Um, <laughs> so I, I think that's just a rite of passage when you're gaming, right? You come up with those house rules and you, 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 you put them into place. And then it isn't until you go into the, some of these LGSs, some, uh, to the stores that people, all of you are running right now where you start to realize, wait a minute, we can't do things like that anymore. <laughs> Um, so I, I think that's that's a great rite of passage that any gamer learning games has has gone through for sure. Um, you mentioned uh, going to Instagram and, and community sourcing a, a lot of the art here. So we have a question. What was your process behind selecting the artists from the community you chose to work with when designing the cards? Um, so and this might get me in trouble, but I, I think that being forthcoming about this stuff is is really important. Um, there are, there's this huge community of, of artists who focus on creating, um, recreating Pokemon, uh, using Ken Sugimori style and creating what, what's called fake, fake -imon, right? So fake Pokemon that they just create, um, that don't really exist in the actual Pokemon brand. Um, and there's some really fantastic stuff that's out there. So, you know, I, I just started reaching out to artists and, you know, talk to them, see, tried to see if they kind of uh, were good to work with, um, if they were open to the idea of, of being, you know, part of this long term. And I think with the exception of one person, one artist, we still have all the original artists on board, um, which I think is like eight, eight of the original artists. Um, and they're still contributing art every week, which is, um, so, you know, for them, they're, they're young, um, they're just getting started. And they've been able to, in some cases, you know, pay off student debt by, by working directly with us, by, you know, signing a few cards. And so um, we really wanted to celebrate. I really wanted to, on a personal level, I really wanted to celebrate the artists and have them be part of the community as much as possible. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that it's a tragedy in some games where that's not the case, where they try to basically white label everything. Um, I want them to be the, the superstars of MetaZoo. Um, and you know, that adds a lot of power, for instance, when they actually visit, you know, a local game store, for instance, to do a signing, um, people are going to be like, that's Victor Larson, or, you know, that's Kelsey. She made Mothman, the original art. Um, 
and, and have them be accessible in that way. And, you know, so for me, it, it was just approaching normal people who were doing this stuff kind of in the, as a pastime. And now they're able to live off of their passion, which is amazing. And I mean, I know this is kind of just a recurring theme for us at this point. I, I, I think that passion is important. And what I love about it, where you found these artists is they were already doing it, right? The fake them on stuff. It's like, they're, they're clearly passionate enough to just do this on their own. And yeah. it drove them into this, into this area. So you're already self-selecting artists who have the same passion you do to create this product the way you do. And that, that's just, that's just the way, you know, finding, finding artists who are already just because of their interest, because their passion, doing this for free and putting it out there and then saying, Hey, I'd like to, I'd like to get you to do this and work with me and be a part of this and do the exact same thing you're already doing for free is amazing. Cause you already know they're dialed in. You already know this is what they love and this is what they want to do. So <laughs> That, exactly. that is crucial for building community and for getting, um, you know, all, all that, that getting that vision. Cause you already know there's a shared vision and getting it out there together is pretty, pretty amazing. Um, so I'm not sure we have another question and I'm not sure what you can, uh, can or can't share here. So just with the caveat, I'm going to ask Michael this question. I don't know that there's anything to share right now, but can you share your plans for MetaZoo's organized play program and what retailers can expect in terms of support from your company? Um, so that's a great question. Um, I expect to be working very close with Channel Fireball and some other uh, supporters of the community and, and, and kind of coming up with a, a um, organized play plan and a tournament plan. Um, we have a lot of ideas that we've already started kind of uh, alpha testing. Um, but in terms of support, what we anticipate doing is, is having kits available for local game stores that will allow them to very, very cheaply um, set up organized uh, play events at their store um, and have uh, kind of top down support from MetaZoo in, in terms of, you know, um, making sure that these things get, I, I don't, I can't go into too much detail, but we, we're also doing training right now with um, what we're calling MetaZooologists, which are kind of like professors or judges. <laughs> I um, love it. I love and, it they're going to be um, something that your store can kind of sign up and, and participate in. Um, and we're looking at a point system right now that's actually based off of chess's um, point system. So it's called, I think the FIDE system. Um, and it's, it's a really simple system that um, allows for, for players at the LGS level all the way up to nationals or worlds to actually see their path um, from the local game store level to city tournaments, to state tournaments, to regionals, to, to country, and then to worlds. Um, and I want to give as much insight into that process as possible. Very similar to what Flesh and Blood just announced this week as well, right? Mm -hmm. uh, having visibility on how you can become a, a kitchen table player to a pro player um, and making a living off of that is something that um, we are taking very, very seriously, very seriously. And I think, you know, th th it's funny, this is kind of the old school gamer, maybe in both of us is that that, pro that, that professional, that aspirational professional model is so important. And I, 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 I mean, Channel, Channel Fireball President and CEO, John Sasso, John and I, we grew up together and we used to say it all the time. We'd call it the year that dreams come true, where we'd made it, we'll, we're gonna take a year off and all we're gonna do is grind <laughs> our way onto the Magic Pro Tour, you know, the now defunct, unfortunately, Magic Pro Tour. And that's what we're gonna do for, and we're gonna get on the PT and we're gonna play professional Magic for some period of time. Um, and that's just a defini the, the, the definition of, of aspiration, right? Literally, it was our goal to do that. We aspired to make that happen. Um, and I think that's so important with, with engaging the audience, right? Because collectors, they're not, they're, they're not gonna be engaged by that competitive play, but you have that collector aspiration of getting, you know, the Kickstarter product, the first edition product, whatever it is. And then you have this aspirational uh, path for gamers who wanna play the game and, and, and be good at the game and excel at the game and, and, and hopefully, you know, find a way to make a living on that game. And these aren't mutually exclusive categories. There's ways where you capture them both. And I, I've always loved that with collectible card gaming uh, specifically. Um, we're up and, against time here. Oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, Michael, do you have any final thoughts, things we want to leave uh, our retail group here? So I, I was going to say like one of the things that we really want to do that, like, for instance, I think that Pokemon, um, the idea behind it was, is really fantastic, but we want to take it to the next level is we really want to merge that collectability with organized play. Mm -hmm. And we have this whole concept of medals, um, which are kind of like, you know, badges or trophies or whatever but it's not just organized play, it's community involvement. It's, it's, it's engaging in, in a certain way. So we have a, a, a medal, for instance, which is 
um, a medal that you get if you are able to get your local game store to sign up with MetaZoo. Um, or we have medals for local for local game stores if they hold organized like events. And, and these things are limited print runs. And so like, there's so many different ways of, of like you said, re- these things are not mutually exclusive. And if you're clever, um, you can have them support each other. Um, and I think, you know, there's no reason why you can't do that. And, and MetaZoo is very um, ambitious when it comes to merging the collectability of the, of the game with the organized and tournament, you know, play that we have planned for it. So we talked, we, when we started with the, the initial question uh, that I asked was kind of, was there a cryptid inspiration? And you said, yeah. no, man. So um, <laughs> we, we do have Pokemon, the Pokemon company coming up. But before we get to them, I just want to ask you, do you have a favorite Pokemon? Um, Mothman. No, <laughs> um, I, I'm pretty basic. Like I love, I'm a Charizard fanboy, you know? Wow. Uh, it's like the Shivan Dragon. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Like I, I am, um, I love dragons. I love big monsters that um, I can kind of base my love for the entire brand around. Right. And I think Mothman has that personally, Mothman has that, um, that same effect on me. Charizard does. Um, and I think, you know, in similar vein, Black Lotus for, for Magic the Gathering, right? Like oh, they absolutely. Are brand, their brand, like linchpins or like anchors, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, Charizard. <laughs> I, I, I'm I'm also old school, but I'm gonna go with Squirtle. I've always I've always been a Squirtle fan. So a hey, Squirtle Squad, I think, is you know that's a, it's a close second for me. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> good, good. Well, thank you so much, uh, Michael. And I mean, it, it's always great because look, gamers, all of us, everyone who's got a retail store, every you know myself, everyone at Channel Fireball, we're all gamers, and it's just it warms my heart to see a gamer like yourself finding this kind of success with the game, pursuing that passion. I mean, you had this, I mean, you know, what, what a crazy story. I, I look forward to, to sitting down with you, Michael. Here you grew up in Brazil, left Goldman Sachs to come launch this game in a Kickstarter, found success, uh, you know, in MetaZoo, incorporating all the cryptid stuff that clearly you were inspired by, by the Mothman prop- prophecies years ago. So there's, there's, there's so much to be, to be, uh, to be told here. And uh, I'm, I'm sure as you develop in the gaming world and as we get more and more MetaZoo, we're going to learn more and more about you. But I'm excited and I'm so happy for you because like I said, gamers, we know our own. You're definitely a gamer uh, and that's super duper exciting. So congratulations, Michael. Um, thank you so much for sharing your time with us. Our next presentation is the Pokemon Company with Stephanie Flores and Courtney Kim. Stephanie Flores is from uh, Organized Play. Stephanie, uh, and then Courtney, I believe, is in their marketing department. They're going to join us live here. We haven't had the Pokemon Company before. So la- our, our, at our last LGSC, we didn't have the Pokemon Company. So I'm incredibly excited to, to welcome them for the first time to LGSC to hear what they have to say about Pokemon, which is, you know, kind of similar to MetaZoo, just on fire right now. Po- every Pokemon product under the sun is just exploding. So it's a great, great time uh, to be involved with the Pokemon Company be carrying Pokemon when you can get it. I know, I know it's tough to, uh, to get your hands on sometimes. So stick with us. We're going to take a little bit longer break here. Just, you know, not, we'll be back by 12 noon, but I want to give everyone a chance to get a drink of water, go run to the restroom if you want, uh, and then come back and join us for Stephanie Flores and Courtney Kim from the Pokemon company. We'll be right back. Thanks again, Thank Michael.